Feels like fire. I'm so in love with you. Purge the soul. Make love your goal. I'll protect you from the hooded claw. Keep the vampires from your door. Actually, it turns out I won't be doing that because there is a vampire in this episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and it comes right to the door of Duel Academy. So uh, I did a bit of a shit job of protecting you from that. Next thing you know, the hooded claw is gonna show up and challenge someone to a card game. Hey guys, it's little Karibo here, back once again with another episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX uh, to watch and respond to. That sounds like Yu-Gi-Oh! GX sent me a letter and I have to write a very terse response to it. Hey Jaden, how dare you send me this correspondence? No, actually, as usual, it is just me, little Karibo, talking about my reactions to an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX in this series that is titled Little Karibo Watches Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, episode 31. I had to check the, the title. I don't know about you, but I have trouble remembering what number episode or even what title episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm watching because they all kind of blend together. And that's not exclusive to GX. That is true of uh, all Yu-Gi-Oh! shows. I wouldn't be able to tell you the name of the episodes where Joey duels Esperoba because they feel, to me, exactly like every other episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, what, what were they called? Like, dueling a psychic guy? What is it called? Joey versus the carnival folk? What's it called? Every episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! is basically the same thing. Guy walks into a room, another guy walks into the room, they both play a card game. I just summarized the whole show. I defeated the purpose of my job! Anyway, yes, this is Little Karibo watches Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. And if you've never watched this show, uh, you're in for a very rambly treat. Yes, I watch an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, uh, the dub, and uh, I get on camera and I have a chat about uh, the events of the episode, what the characters did, usually a card game, and uh, how they responded to it, and then I'll talk about my responses to their responses. That's usually how this goes. Hopefully it's entertaining. Uh, if you're not finding it entertaining, I'm not sure why you're watching episode 32. 32? 30? 31. I, I'm losing track of my own episodes. They all feel the same as well. You see, I can't criticize Yu-Gi-Oh for feeling very samey, because I'm super samey. You so-called super samey. I'm very giggly for some reason. Anyway, yes, this is a show where I watch a show, and then I make a show out of showing you how I felt. If you've ever seen like a reaction video, it's kind of like that, except you don't get to watch the episode with me. You just kind of experience what my train of thought is like. If you have been watching this series and you've forgotten what the current scenario is, as I often do, like last episode, I was very excited that I remembered what the Shadow Riders were called. And that's kind of sad, because I should be paying attention. I should be paying much closer attention to a show where I'm making a show about the show. But no, it's easy to forget exactly what Jade and Yuki and company are going through from time to time. So what is going on with them? Currently, they are trying to prevent the Shadow Riders, who are some sort of clandestine Illuminati-esque organization, far as I can tell, uh, who are trying to get these artifacts so they can release the sacred beasts. That'll do something bad. <clears throat> something is gonna happen and it's not good. <laughs> Look, I may have forgotten more than I'm willing to admit about what's going on at Duel Academy. But to be fair, they don't make it easy. But yeah, the, the gist is you got Jaden, Cyrus, Zane, Bastion, Cyrus, I said Cyrus, Crowler, Banner, and I think somebody else in there as well. They're all guarding these little, uh, what are they called? Little Tetris blocks that they've got around their necks. A little necklace. Alexis is one of them as well. I should just make the show all about me trying to recap what's happened without any memory of it. It's way more entertaining this way. But yeah, Jaden and friends are guarding these little MacGuffins that will help the bad guys unlock these evil sacred beasts or these powerful sacred beasts. The sacred beasts are bad if they get out, it sounds like. So these Shadow Riders are challenging Jaden and company two duels to get those little items from them. But yeah, Jaden and company are doing pretty well so far. They uh, defeated one Shadow Rider called Night Shroud, who was possessing Alexis's long lost brother. If this sounds like a soap opera, 
It is. Imagine watching an episode of Coronation Street, except everybody challenges each other to hologram card games. And Jaden had to be kind of hospitalized because he had a bad time inside that volcano, as you usually do. You don't normally go into a volcano and come out unscathed. So yeah, he's recovering. And now that I've given you that very concise and articulated recap of the events of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, let's dive right in to episode 31 of the dub, titled Field of Screams Part 1. Obviously named after the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come to play card games. To be honest, Field of Dreams would be vastly improved if you introduced dual monsters to it. Who wants to watch a movie about baseball? Not even any holograms in it. And the episode starts with a boat coming out of the misty fog on the ocean. Uh, with seemingly no navigator. Is the rower from Naruto gonna make a cameo here? Cause you know that rower, he's always cameoing. Holy sh**, f***ing rower! Why would you have a boat in anything and not have the f***ing rower? A flock of bats surrounds the boat, and uh, it should be noted that this footage is all black and white at the moment, so you know a bunch of kids watching probably complained to their parents that there's something wrong with the TV. And they're not lying, something is deeply wrong with the TV, they're using it to watch Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Inside the boat, a coffin wrapped in a blanket is being carried across the sea. And I'm glad that someone took the time to tuck that coffin in. Maybe give it a bedtime story, you know, cup of tea. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm coffin, I need a good lie down too. Where the f*** is the rower?! The coffin lid opens slowly, and the bats all squeak in celebration. And then a lingering shot of some monochromatic mammaries pans up to reveal a vampire lady sitting up in the coffin. And her lipstick is the only thing that has any colour in this shot, and it's bright red. So, uh, this is the only time in history that you would be right in comparing Yu-Gi-Oh! GX to Schindler's List. The vampire lady laughs, and then we smash cut to Jaden waking up. So I can only assume he was dreaming about that black and white vampire lady. Jaden, you have a perfectly good Sparkman bottom in your deck. You don't need to be dreaming about no vampire lady. Cyrus is sat at Jaden's bedside in the nurse's office, and he asks Jaden if he's okay. That is a big question, Cyrus. A lot to unpack. Weird dream. I saw a girl. Uh, confirmation that Jaden doesn't normally dream about girls. So he probably normally dreams about chilling out with his crew in the schoolyard. In his underwear. You know, finding trouble, never looking too hard. In his underwear. Off screen, the ever so peppy Fonda Fontaine says, You must be feeling better if you're dreaming about girls. Oh what, he's been unconscious until this very moment, and the first thing you do is rib him for having a sex dream. Jaden asks how Alexis's brother is doing, and Fonda explains that he hasn't woken up yet. Ah, the third degree burns from his spontaneously combusting hang glider must have just been too much for him. But don't worry, I'm sure when he does wake up, Fonda Fontaine will be there for him to tease him for fantasizing about a lady. You know, like nurses do. Is she a nurse? What's she doing there? We zoom in on Alexis's brother's face, and we see that they've given him a mask to help him breathe. You know, if you imagine the tube and the filters aren't there, he kinda looks like he's got a big blue cartoon duck nose and he's got his mouth wide open. Cool, look at that cartoon duck man with his Bashonen anime mullet. God, he's attractive. Meanwhile, the vampire lady in her boat commands her bat minions to go find her prey, and they all fly off. The vampire lady then holds a red rose betwixt her black and white bosoms and says, so that we can succeed where Night Shroud failed. Look, you've already picked a better mode of transportation than exploding hang glider, so I think you're well on your way. And then, of course, we get that cracker of a tune, the GX opening theme. I guess we should probably do the vampire version of it this time, since there's a vampire in the episode. Chilling out with the crew in the graveyard. Biting necks. Sunlight leaves us very scarred. When we return to Duel Academy, we hear what sounds like two Hanna-Barbera characters having a very loud conversation about a sp 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 spooky vampire. Hey, did you hear about the vampire? Vampire? Dude, I saw her with my own two eyes. Or at least my roommate did. She's got these gigantic Fangs. We better find our two friends, a redhead lady and a nerd who keeps losing her glasses, and find this vampire. Uh, uh, don't forget to bring your talking dog. It's a girl vampire, but she better stay away from my boyfriend. 
You know, that might sound absurd, but Stacy there actually has a history of losing her boyfriends to mythological creatures. Her last boyfriend was seduced by a man-bear pig. And before that, she was stood up for the prom because her boyfriend was too busy making out with YouTube customer support. In the Chancellor's office, Chaz is shocked to hear that they're making a sequel to Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Vampire? I'm afraid the rumors may not be rumors after all. Crowler insists that it's some sort of practical joke. You know, much akin to putting a whoopee cushion on someone's seat or dipping their hand in shaving cream while they're sleeping. You know, saying that there is a vampire at a school. Classic prank. A joke? It wasn't a joke that put Jaden in the hospital. Even if it was extremely funny. Do you think she's a shadow rider? And if I told her my dick is a shadow, do you think she'd ride it? Chancellor Shepard says to be on the lookout for anything strange. What, like a giant man who routinely dresses in dozens of school uniforms in order to hide his identity? Or the Tarzan dude who kept stealing people's egg witches? Or the stoner boy who lives inside a giant science fiction bubble? Or the cyborg monkey that can play children's card games? Or the th King Undertaker, or the ancient artifact that unlocks a door to another dimension that's populated by gravekeepers, or literally anything that happens at this card game university. I mean, compared to all that, a vampire seems fairly pedestrian. In his dorm room, we see Chaz chazzing out his deck and saying that he'd like to see this vampire get the jump on Chaz. Meanwhile, in the rafters, one of the vampire lady's bats is hanging upside down and checking out Chaz's cards. Bat! Bastion is also studying his cards, no doubt to ensure that they're all covered in hastily scribbled equations that nobody can decipher except him. Also at his window, a bat peeks inside at him. Bat! Zane is also looking through his deck, though he's probably more concerned with whether or not this vampire lady is as attractively emo as him. Also there's a bat at his window too. Bat! Crowler is not phased by all this, though he is. A vampire? What's next, the boogeyman? No, he's not wrestled in years, Crowler. Although I understand the confusion, given that we just saw The Undertaker come out of retirement to uh, duel Jaden. And there's a bat. Bat! Professor Banner has hung garlic all about his room and is trying desperately to ward off any vampires, insisting that he has a huge horror movie collection and he knows all their weak spots. We all know he's lying, of course. All he has is the Twilight movies and that's it. So he's gonna get a rude awakening when it turns out this vampire lady don't sparkle. Pharaoh the cat is hiding behind Professor Banner. Brah! Oh, you get all worked up over a vampire, but when I tell you there's a werewolf prowling around the island, you just ignore me and pet me on the butt. Doesn't matter that it just turned out to be the janitor's dog, you should be taking me seriously. Meow. I'm a cat. Also, bat. Bat! We then go to Jaden in the nurse's office, and Alexis asks how he's doing. Well, it's not looking good. He hasn't been able to get his game on in 24 hours. His game is quite literally off. He hasn't said anything since last night. And it's great. We're all very relieved. We were all starting to wonder what it was like to live in a world without obnoxious catchphrases. Cyrus asks how Alexis's brother is doing, and she says pretty much the same, though he'll get better. Not sure how she knows that. It must be that remarkable intuition she's always demonstrating. He's a fighter, you know? I know. After all, he did kidnap me and put me in a magical bubble hovering over a pool of lava. So yeah, I know. Alexis hopes the rest of the group is prepared because it sounds like the next Shadow Rider is here. You know, Shadow Rider still sounds like a rejected Marvel character to me. Or an accepted DC character. And Bat. Bat! The vampire lady is then seen bathing in a tub of water and flower petals. Presumably in the abandoned dorm? I don't know where she is. Wait, is she Elizabeth Bathory? Get it? Cause she's in a bath? Anyway, she's nude. A bat swoops into the room and the vampire lady catches it. Can't wait to learn her name so I don't have to keep saying vampire lady. My precious, what did you bring me? Well, knowing bats as I do, probably a virus of some sort, but I doubt it's important, nothing to worry about. The bat telepathically communicates with the vampire lady and tells her all about the duelist that she might have to face. And at one point, Bastion appears in her eyes, which to be honest, is likely worse than any stigmatism anyone has ever had. Hey guys, I'm a stigmatism. She settles on Zane and says, yes, you, you will be my first. Which is also what some impressionable young women 
and young men were likely thinking when they first got a gander at Zane. Back at the Chancellor's office, the duelists have reconvened and Chaz insists that there are no vampires on campus because he checked. Lots of Bigfoots though, plenty of Bigfoots. It's kind of strange, you can't throw a rock at Duel Academy without hitting a Bigfoot. Then Chumley runs into the office and insists he's seen the vampire at the lake. First of all, holy sh Chumley did something to advance the plot, mark that down. Secondly, we all know that Chumley is an expert vampire detector because he crams his gullet so full of garlic fries that he sets them off whenever he breathes. He's fat! The group then heads to the lake based purely on Chumley's word. Which is an incredible thing, everyone listening to Chumley. A red carpet then rolls across the surface of the lake, and Crowler is impressed that they're getting the red carpet treatment. Zane comments that it's crimson red. Oh, of course, because vampires make sure that their carpets match the color of blood in case they spill any. That, that makes sense. But smart. Crowler and Banner try and hide behind the students which is just tremendous behavior being exemplified by the staff at a school. Come study at Duel Academy. We will feed you to a horrifying cryptid monster if we feel like our safety is remotely threatened. Crowler and Banner's butts bump into each other, and this causes Crowler to believe that he's being attacked by a vampire, so he jumps in front of the group. Hey, if being attacked by a vampire feels like a butt, then please, vampires, attack me. Come on, have at me, eh? Eh? I've got a juicy neck and a plethora of arteries, so by all means. Everyone assumes that Crowler's panicky display was him volunteering to play a card game with a vampire, so they congratulate him on his bravery. Yes, in the long history of vampire hunters, you have Van Helsing, Buffy, D, and uh, now Professor Crowler from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Crowler immediately suggests that they all draw straws to see who'll face the vampire, which baffles all of them as it is a game that doesn't involve cards of any kind. Over in the nurse's office, Chumley, wow, he's getting around today, isn't he? Uh, bursts in and announces that Crowler is gonna duel the vampire lady. Does Cyrus even know that there's a vampire? He's been sat by Jaden's bed this whole time, hasn't he? Cyrus, Crowler's gonna duel a vampire. Also, there is a vampire! Actually, Cyrus isn't phased whatsoever and says, Good, Crowler will beat her easily. I'm not sure how Cyrus came to that conclusion as A, Crowler lost definitively to Jaden in the first episode, B, we have no idea what cards this vampire is using, and C, it's a father mucking vampire. It could devour all of you if it wanted. You know, in retrospect, this episode should be called What We Duel in the Shadows, shouldn't it? But no, yeah, Crowler will have no trouble defeating this vampire, what with his long history of defeating immortal creatures of darkness in card games. Alexis just f***ing slaughters Crowler with her words. Wrong, Sai. Crowler may talk a big game, but he plays a terrible one. Then why is he teaching here? Also, is now really the time to be criticizing his technique when he's about to have his body sucked dry by a Nosferatu? Next time your brother's life is in peril, I'm gonna be like, oh, if only you didn't have garbage tier card game skills. See how you like it. Jaden finally wakes up, presumably because he heard the word terrible and thought people were talking about him. Winged Karibo appears next to Jaden and makes Karibo noises at him which roughly translate to, Good morning, honey. Your breakfast is in the microwave as you overslept. Again. Back at the lake, Crowler is staring at the water nervously, and Chaz says, What's the holdup? What do you want him to do? Walk across the lake to his certain doom? Besides, everyone knows a vampire can't challenge you to a children's card game until you invite them to. The mist fades away and we hear an electric guitar riff. Ah uh, yes, the traditional instrument associated with vampires. And we see the vampire lady stood in her boat in the middle of the lake, and she offers to just come to them. And I've just noticed that she has a bat symbol clasped between her cleavage, which is gonna prove very awkward if Batman shows up there expecting to have a chat with Commissioner Gordon. Wouldn't mind exploring her bat cave though. Seriously, where the f is the rower! She climbs out of the boat and casually starts walking down the red carpet toward the duelists, and Crowler stands there nervously hoping that his duel vest will be enough to protect him. Actually, duel vests would be the perfect way for a vampire to play duel monsters and feel protected, because nobody could shove a stake through their hearts. Also, I just 
fucking love the dual vest. The vampire lady is rather disappointed that Crowler is the one that's gonna challenge her. You are not worthy. I beg your pardon? I have a PhD in dueling! Yeah, but Alexis said you were bad, so... Who am I gonna trust, a PhD or a character who has yet to win a duel on screen herself? The vampire lady finally introduces herself. Then you may do me, Camula, vampire mistress of the Shadow Riders. Ah, she's called Camula because she's like Dracula if he were a cam girl. Banner says, So she is the vampire. I need to get new horror movies. Yeah, he was expecting Bella Lugosi, whereas he actually got Bella Lugosi. With two L's, because it's a pretty lady. Crowler scoffs. Rubber bats and plastic teeth. Somehow, Sean Schemmel sells that line better than any line I've ever heard in Yu-Gi-Oh! ever. Camula explains that if Crowler loses, his soul will be put inside a little sack boy from Little Big Planet, which is a terrible fate, because nobody played that sh so he'll be alone forever. Is that all? Don't want anything for your mummy, or perhaps something for your pet werewolf to chew on. Hey, look at this guy just scoffing at ancient Egyptian superstition, like we didn't just have an entire series that starred a dead pharaoh. Camula says, be careful what you wish for, it might come true. Oh, what, now we're bringing Wishmaster into this? D does any other horror icon want to play a children's card game? Freddy Krueger? Pinhead? Camula accepts Crowler's challenge and then she activates her Shadow Rider brand dual disc. And it's freaking crazy. It looks like a bat wing or something. It looks, it's just freaking cool. It's just so cool. And it's just, I'm sure they wouldn't have gone to these lengths to design a dual disc so cool for her if she was just gonna disappear after a few episodes. So get ready to see a lot of Camula. The duel begins and Camula summons Zombie Werewolf, which is presumably a zombie that will only eat your brains if served to them in a dog food bowl. Camula sets a card face down and then ends her turn, and Crowler accuses her of setting a really obvious trap. I mean, you'd be the expert, Mr. I'm going to leave a romantic note in Jaden's locker and hope he's stupid enough to walk into the girls' dorm. Crowler activates the spell card Ancient Gear Castle, which gives all of his Ancient Gear monsters 300 extra attack, and is impressed impressive an opening move as that might seem to be, remember Alexis said he was shit, so ignore it. Next he summons Ancient Gear Soldier, which looks for all the world like one of the Sentinels from X-Men if H.G. Wells designed them, and also he gave them a big fuck off gun. H.G. Wells obviously famous for giving people big fuck off guns, that's why his name was Huge Guns Wells. I think it's time we gave that filthy slobbering mongrel of yours his shots! Look, you can get the werewolf as drunk as you like, Crowler. Just don't give it any blue moon. It'll just get more werewolfy. Crowler has his ancient gear soldier attack zombie werewolf with its big fuck off gun. Just like that classic scene in the Underworld series where a giant robot shot all the lichens with a big fuck off gun. Zane says, I guess that Crowler is more of a cat person. Prah! I'll have you know that just because Crowler murdered a werewolf, it doesn't mean we cats get along with him. It takes a lot more than using a giant robot to shoot an anthropomorphic canine to make us like the guy. Although it is a good start. Meow. Camula reveals that when her zombie werewolf is destroyed, she gets to summon another one from her deck with 500 extra attack points. You know, if Yami Yugi were dealing with this situation, he would just attack the moon and deal with the whole thing in one fell swoop. Camula takes her turn and summons Vampire Bat in attack mode. Bat! A congregation of bats appears on the field and forms into a single giant vampire bat. And with it on the field, all of Camula's zombie monsters gain 200 attack points. Crowler mocks her. Don't the three of you look so cute? You know, if you had bags, you could go trick-or-treating! Yeah, but there's no candy on the island, so they just end up with a bag full of bland-tasting egg witches, or... Whatever it is I'm holding? Yeah. Camula commands Zombie Werewolf to attack Ancient Gear Soldier with Midnight Pounce. You know, I myself wouldn't mind a good Midnight Pounce with Camula. Anyway, the werewolf bites the giant robot and it explodes, which is why you should always werewolf-proof your giant robot in case of this exact situation. At the very least, make them entirely out of silver. It's expensive as hell, but clearly worth it. Vampire Bat attacks next with Swarming Skirt and they reenact that bit from the recent Tom Cruise mummy movie where it's confusing and terrible and you can't tell what's going on. <laughs> 
Yes, the bats all surround Crowler and activate some sort of sonar effect, but they don't actually appear to be touching him or doing any real damage to him. Which is why it's weird when he says, I can actually feel their little teeth! Don't you mean their rubber bats and plastic teeth? Crowler realizes this is no hologram, this is a shadow game! I love how he went from vampires, here, trying to take my soul, oh yeah, that's totally a real thing, to ow, a bat bit me, dark magic must be at work. So in the future guys, if you're ever having trouble convincing somebody that you're right about something in an argument, just unleash a flock of bats onto them. They'll soon believe everything you say. Back in the nurse's office, Cyrus is watching the duel go down on a little pocket computer device that apparently can show him whatever he wants to see. So what, the school gives these things out to students, but they can't afford basic security measures to protect them? Oh, another kid went missing over by the abandoned dorm. Wish we had some sort of security camera or any monitoring device to tell us what happened. Anyway, I'm gonna go FaceTime with Fonda Fontaine on this Pokédex or whatever the f this thing is. It can see anything. On the wall behind Jaden's hospital bed, we see a chart that shows how many times Jaden has said get your game on on every day of the week. It's a lot. Jaden's eyes open. Again. So I guess when he regained consciousness earlier, he just fell right back asleep. I mean, if, if I were woken by Chumley, I would pretend to be unconscious too. Back at the duel, Camula teases Crowler. For rubber bats, they pack quite a wallop, don't they? <sighs> you know, I'm willing to bet that is the only time a vampire has ever used the word wallop. Although there was that one time Bella Lugosi's Dracula famously said, The children of the night. What a wallop they make. I never drink wallop. Camula gives Crowler the opportunity to step down and let Zane take his place as challenger, to which Mark rechazzes. I mean, to which Chaz remarks, You hear that, Zane? It sounds as though you're her type. Well, she is one of the Legion of the Undead, so presumably Zane's soulless eyes, dead voice, and complete lack of emotional investment in literally anything remind her of one of her supernatural brethren. Crowler roundly rejects capitulating to Camula and delivers a genuinely inspiring speech about how if she wants to get to his students, she'll have to go through him. Basically, imagine the president's speech from the movie Independence Day, except he's wearing a dual vest and he's got ridiculous shoulder tassels on. I mean, people say you can't improve on perfection, but I think that would do it. Snap tries to chaz Crowler out of it, but Crowler says, Don't worry about me. I still have a dick in my hand. You know what they say, a dick in the hand is worth two in the- Let's not use that phrase. Crowler plays his face down card, Damage Condenser. Sadly, there is no way to condense the damage done to millions of children who watched this show and grew up believing Bastion was respectable. This card allows Crowler to summon a monster whose attack is equal to or less than the damage that Camula just inflicted on him. In other words, the more pain you deal, the more hurt you'll feel. You know, that's actually a really good life philosophy. Philosophy. And I should know because my comedy has caused an enormous amount of pain. Crowler summons Ancient Gear Soldier and then sacrifices it to summon Ancient Gear Beast, which is just Ravage from Transformers if Transformers was hella steampunk. Crowler goes to attack Zombie Werewolf with Ancient Gear Beast, and Chaz warns him that if he does that, Camula will just summon another one. And everyone knows when you bring a werewolf back, it just sucks. I mean, look at an American Werewolf in Paris, or The Howling 2, or Teen Wolf 2, spelt T-O-O -O because the producers hated you. Crowler explains that Ancient Gear Beast cancels out the effects of any destroyed monster, and Bastion says, Clever calculations. Which is a valiant effort to dethrone Jaden's catchphrase as the worst catchphrase of the show, but sadly it falls short. Crowler channels Howard Dean, Attack Zombie Werewolf! Ah! Ancient Gear Beast bites Zombie Werewolf right in the wear dick, destroying him. Wolfman's got an art. Camula's unlife points drop to 3200, and Crowler offers to give her a lesson in dueling strategies, impressing the students behind him. Crowler's lesson plans really do work. Quiet. He'll only give us more homework. 
Oh, like that wouldn't give you the biggest math boner of your life, Bastion. Mm, no. Mm, no more homework, Professor, please. Mm, I just couldn't do another assignment. Mm. Camula casts the field spell Infernalvania, and the lake behind her is replaced by a gothic castle. Gothic castle. Yep, that's what I said. Then Camula explains by discarding one zombie monster from her hand, she can destroy every monster on the field. I haven't seen a castle do that much damage since Marvel's The Punisher. Chaz, Chaz explains that with Infernalvania out, Camula won't be able to normal summon monsters anymore. Have you seen her, Chaz? I don't think she does anything normal, summon or otherwise. Camula says she doesn't need any more monsters, and Crowler intimates that he knows what she's referring to. I know all about that bat of yours. I'd prefer to know all about that butt of hers, but I'll settle for the bat. Camula explains that her bat can be made indestructible simply by discarding another bat from her deck. Would that make it unbattable? You know, like unbeatable, but it's... but it's... Bat? Okay, I'll discard one pun from my list so that that one works. Camula then discards Vampire Lord, who looks for all the world like Edward Cullen if he got really into high Q, in order to activate Infernal Vania's effect. And just like she said, all the monsters on the field are destroyed, except for Vampire Bat! Yep. Once again, Camula has a swarm of bats surround Crowler and attack him with their weird sonar energy effect. And now that I think about it, bats must be one of the biggest problems in the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe. After all, you walk around with exaggerated hair like that, you're just asking for a bat to get caught in it. What I'm saying is never go spelunking with someone from Yu-Gi-Oh! Crowler falls to the floor, exhausted from the bat attack, insisting that nobody help him. You must protect your keys! <laughs> and speaking of keys, ow, I fell right on mine! Crowler's life points drop to 1700, and everybody watching gasps, except for Bastion, who somehow goes mmm with his mouth wide open. Zane is concerned, I think. It's hard to tell with his voice. We can't just stand here and do nothing! But that's the majority of the show. So yeah, you can do that. Everyone is shocked, including Camula, when Chumley arrives carrying Jaden and passes him onto Cyrus's shoulder. And Jaden says Dr. Crowler will win this duel, which is enough to stir Crowler awake. I know that voice. It's Slacker. Yes. It's Slacker. It's not THE Slacker. It's not A Slacker. It's not even THAT Slacker. It is Slacker. It's rather like when I meet up with an old mate and I'm like, Oh hey, it is friend. Or when I meet the guy who wrote this line and I say, Oh look, it is idiot. Jaden says he knows Crowler can win because he's dueled him. Yeah, and didn't you rather easily win? If he can't defeat an annoying being like you, that doesn't bode well for his chances against an immortal being. Jaden tells Crowler to get his game on, which has to be the most humiliating thing to happen to Crowler since he got a PhD in dueling. Crowler defiantly spits Camula's insults back in her face. I'm here to stay too, missy. You see, though, it makes me slightly ill to admit it. Jaden is absolutely right! Well, as the saying goes, even a broken clock is right twice a day. The rest of the day, you sat there being very annoyed by the clock and wondering why you bought a broken clock. Crowler continues, I can beat you! I can throw down and I can get my game on! Well, now it's pointless to take Crowler's soul anymore because he just tainted it by saying Jaden's catchphrase. Might as well just take Chumley's soul at this point. Defying all logic and reason, Crowler successfully gets his game on and summons Ancient Gear Golem, causing Quaz to chip, causing Chaz to quip, Check it! Crowler's best monster! Check it? Don't you mean Chaz it? And shouldn't there be some sort of direction involved, like upwards? Such as, I don't know, Chaz it upwards? Chaz it up, maybe? You're being very vague with this check it nonsense, Chaz. Crowler commands Ancient Gear Golem to attack, and it hurls a rocket fist right through Camula's vampire bat only for it to reform afterwards due to its invincible status. You know, any minute Ace Ventura is gonna rush the field and grab that bat, insisting that it's been stolen from the Wachati tribe. Yeah, I'm making Ace Ventura 2 references. I have no shame. Before Camula can activate her Infernal Vania's effect, Crowler destroys every spell and trap card on the field using his Heavy Storm card. So Camula destroyed every monster on the field, and then Crowler destroyed every spell and trap card on the field. This feels like the Duel Monsters equivalent 
of one player getting pissed off and flipping the table in disgust, only for the other player to get equally pissed and then flip the table back into a standing position, also in disgust. With both castles now gone, the playing field returns to normal and Camula scoffs at Crowler's efforts. You must be quite a bore for your students, so predictable. Yes, that is the problem with Crowler. His predictability. The guy who punishes you by making you play a game of tennis and also dresses like he's about to have his ship boarded by Captain Jack Sparrow. Yeah, he's super predictable. Very dull. Camula and Crowler reenact a typical Twitter argument. Please, you don't know what you're talking about. <sighs> oh, don't I? I don't know about you, but my Twitter conversations frequently end with the other person unhinging their jaw and then speaking at me through their serpent-like tongue. I take a lot of LSD before using social media. Camula then activates her trap card, Zombie Bed, also known as AMC's The Walking Bed. I hate myself for that one. Crowler demands to know why Zombie Bed was not destroyed by Heavy Storm, and it turns out that Zombie Bed can only be activated by destroying it. And with a crazy twist like that, you'd think Camula's gonna do something super unpredictable, and no, she's just gonna summon another zombie werewolf. You know, a lot of people say werewolf, but nobody ever stops to say how wolf. Camula continues to mock Crowler with her mouth agape and her tongue wagging wildly at him. Most women have a come hither look. That's Camula's come with a look. And I'd probably still fall for it, to be honest. But how did Camula know what to expect from Crowler's deck? It's easy when you have a hundred flying bats spying on everyone. Oh, she had bats look at them. You see, this is why I always make sure my deck is protected with a bat-proof casing. I mean, the sheer number of times that Konami has had to cancel tournaments because of bat-related incidents, you'd think that Crowler would have cottoned onto it by now. Jaden is shocked by the bat's betrayal, and and Camula demonstrates that she studied at the Tida School for natural sounding laughter. <laughs> Camula activates the spell card Book of Life, which isn't as good as the spell card Coco, but it's serviceable. This allows Camula to summon Vampire Lord and once again sacrifice him after about five seconds in order to summon Vampire Genesis. Gotta say, Phil Collins is looking good these days. Using all that Tarzan money to build a gym in his house paid off in droves. With Vampire Bat on the field, Vampire Genesis is... Vampire Genesis is... The vampire guy's attack points raised to 3,200. Realizing he's likely about to lose, Crowler turns and addresses the students behind him, saying that he knows he's been hard on them in the past, but it's only because he believes in them. Tad disingenuous just because we've seen and heard Crowler attempt to get Jaden expelled multiple times just because of a personal grudge he has against the kid, but, I mean, he must just believe in him so much that he hates his guts. Huh. Maybe I believe in Jaden. After all, I too want him to go away and never come back, so... Yes, by that logic, I believe. I believe in Jaden Yuki! Come on everyone, it's time to show Jaden that you believe. Shrug your shoulders! Shrug your shoulders with as much indifference as you can demonstrate! Shrug them with all your might! Shrug them to show that you believe in Jaden! Flip him the bird! Do it! Flip him the strongest bird that you've ever seen in your entire life! Cause you believe in him that much! You see, it's like clapping for Tinkerbell, except it's... Apathy. Therefore, if I fall here, there's still hope. Because I know you all will rise. Don't talk like that. Sorry, Zane, that's just his voice. You're going to have to get used to it. Jaden looks at the human being about to have their soul devoured by a creature of eternal darkness as the last hope for humanity potentially slips away, and he surmises, This isn't good. Camula asks Crowler if he's finished teaching his final lesson, and Crowler insists that she call him Doctor, and she replies that she'd be happy to put that on his tombstone once she's finished with him. You know, if I were being murdered by a vampire, I'd appreciate them having the courtesy to inscribe my job onto my tombstone. Here lies Martin. He made fun of anime. I imagine a lot of people would leave flowers at my grave 
with the message, where's the new episode attached? Vampire Genesis destroys Ancient Gear Golem, but it isn't enough to put Crowler down. So Camula tosses her zombie werewolf at him, which is enough to drop him to 100 life points. And then to add insult to injury, she has her bats squeak him to death. Jaden calls out to Dr. Crowler as he falls, and Crowler literally calls out to Jaden to avenge him. I mean, really? Jaden. I get that you saw I had a bit of a change of heart here, Crowler, but... Jaden. I mean, Zane is standing right there. I I'd even believe you asking Chumley to avenge you, but Jaden? He is the one you're putting all your stock in. Jaden. Crowler falls flat on his face in the traditional I just lost a card game position, although it might be with good cause this time as he might be dead. Camula says that Crowler's key belongs to her now, and even though Jaden shows defiance, Chaz says they're unable to stop her. I mean, none of you are even trying. Banner could just go to his room and whip out some garlic and a steak to take care of her, I mean. Maybe take two dual discs and fashion the shape of a cross with them, I mean. Do something! Camula then pulls out her little sack boy, and a cloud of purple magic escapes from Crowler's body and enters it. In a horrifying display, Crowler's face appears on the doll's blank visage, contorted into a cartoonish grimace. Sadly, this is still better looking than most Yu-Gi-Oh figures that you can buy in shops. Camula reenacts how my friend's daughter reacted when I bought her a birthday present, looking at the Crowler doll for about five seconds before declaring it to be garbage and throwing it to the ground. True story. She then bids farewell, disappearing into the mist, which then dissipates, revealing her ancient vampire castle looming ominously over the duelists. Funnily enough, this only seems slightly less credible than the f***ing card game school that is right next door to it. Somehow that is just slightly less believable than the vampire castle appearing out of nowhere. Camula then leaves them with this chilling message. We'll find you and duel! Children. That's precisely what I'm hoping for. Oh, come on, you had a perfectly good opportunity to say that you're counting on it. You know, count, like the... like the vampire with the... It's funny. Anyway, she turns into some bats, and then she f***s off. And that is the end of the episode. Wow! There are vampires. Does that become a thing? Are there vampires later on in the show? Are, th are they really vampires? Is she a real vampire? I assume she is, because... The show didn't give us any reason to think otherwise. Having said that, we didn't see her bite any necks. So the jury's out. I'm gonna assume, unless there's some big revelation, that yes, real vampires exist. I mean, if ancient Egyptian pharaohs and shadow realm magic can happen, I don't see why vampires can be outside of the realm of possibility. All bets are off at this point, I've got to say. <laughs> what did I think of the episode? I mean... I'm still struggling over this whole vampire thing, sorry. Uh, I mean, it's good. I liked the episode. I really liked the episode because, first of all, Crowler versus a vampire comes out of nowhere. Like, I was not expecting that. I was not expecting, first of all, Crowler to get featured. Obviously, he's one of the duelists that's fighting to protect the sacred beasts. But it's, it's a very different change of pace. And I got oddly invested in Crowler winning the duel. He got very passionate toward the end about defending his students and how he really actually believes in them. Again, I don't think I believe that 100%, just because like his behavior le leading up to this doesn't suggest that he legitimately cares. Well, I mean, he probably cares about them, but he also doesn't seem to like them that much. I don't know, it feels more like Crowler trying to rationalize his own behavior than a legitimate sentiment. Having said that, he still gave it his all, and I mean, it's a really cool development for that character. And you don't see that kind of stuff in Yu-Gi-Oh, typically. This would be like if Tristan sacrificed himself and became a robot monkey. He did that, didn't he? He did do that. So, I guess it's not completely uh, new. But I did really like the episode, I've got to say. This is one of my favorites so far, and I think part of it is because Camula is such a refreshing character within the, uh, the, the gallery of Yu-Gi-Oh villains, like side villains, because I don't, I don't believe she's going to be a main villain. So I, I really dug it. I, I was really into this one. As much as I liked the Night Shroud duel for what it was, it didn't hold a candle to a vampire coming out of nowhere and dueling Crowler. So I'm really excited to, to see what happens next with Camula, because obviously uh, she has Crowler's soul. Or 
she took Crowler's soul, but then threw it on the ground. <laughs> Which is exactly what I would do with Crowler's soul. Who's gonna duel Camula next? I don't know. I imagine uh, Zane. It seems to be leading to Zane, right? Or Chaz. Zane, probably, I imagine. Uh, so I don't know who's gonna defeat Camula. I'm very curious. Uh, it would be great if the duel went so long that the sun came up and she just burnt to a crisp and they were like, I guess it's no contest. What did you think of the episode? Please let me know in the comments. And uh, thank you so much for watching the video. Uh, I do appreciate you guys checking in on these little videos. They're very silly and very long <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but thank you for your patience waiting for them and for your patience watching them. And I hope you did enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed it half as much as I enjoyed watching a vampire duel someone in a children's card game. That was fantastic. The stakes were very high in this duel. Bad puns. Once again, I need to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons, the, the people who are supporting us on Patreon. Thank you so much for all of your, of your support. I'm stumbling over my words because I'm just so grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. Your names are going on the bottom of the screen right down there. And I really do appreciate each and every one of you, everything you guys have given. Uh, I, I can't say how much it helps. It, it really does. I wouldn't be able to keep doing this. And I, I'm so grateful to be able to keep doing this because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to see a bloody vampire dual growler. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd be able to see it, but I wouldn't have nearly as much fun doing that, you know? So thank you. I want to drink your blood. Until next time, please don't invite any vampires into your house, no matter what trading cards they might offer you in exchange. I'll see you next time. Blah. We're going to South Dakota and Oregon and Washington and Michigan. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! Ah!